Welcome to the Buy Box Experts Podcast. We bring to light the unique opportunities brands face in today's e-commerce world. Hey, Joe Hansen here, one of the hosts of the Buy Box Experts Podcast. I have Steven Spear with me. He's the founder and CEO of e-commerce lending. His lending career spans 27 years. His company, e-commerce lending, has funded over seven over $275 million in online business acquisition loans, making it the number one source for online business acquisition financing and the exclusive recommended lender for nearly all the top online business brokerage firms in the country. Stephen has been featured on multiple interview platforms, including Show Me the Nuggets by Joe Troyer and Truth About Exits with Corin Woodmass, among many others. Stephen lives in Florida with his wife of 25 years and their four older children. Welcome to the show, Stephen. Thanks for having me, Joe. Just a quick note, this episode is brought to you by Buybox Experts. Buybox Experts takes ambitious brands and makes them unbeatable. Big brands hire them because of one word, holistic. When you bring, when you bring, when we bring someone on to Buybox Experts, you receive the strategy optimization and marketing performance to succeed on Amazon. We're the only agency that combines executive level insights with expert tactical performance management and execution for your Amazon strategy. So let's get to it, Stephen. Um, I'd love to jump in right away and understand how did you get started with e-commerce lending? Well, I mean, I got started with uh, lending uh, online businesses uh, for business acquisition. Uh, roughly five or six years ago, I had a client um, come to me uh, who was looking for more of a brick and mortar acquisition, which I was heavily involved in at the time. And he said, uh, hey, by the way, I came across this online business that seems really interesting. Um, do you finance online businesses, meaning businesses that sell their products online? I'm like, I, I guess. I, I know. I mean, I buy online and I don't see why not. So I, I researched it and was able to determine by way of, um, you know, underwriters, et cetera, to, to, to determine that I was able to finance businesses that were in the online space. What I soon learned is that the online space was a very different landscape than traditional brick and mortar business acquisitions. So I learned very quickly and um, soon, um, you know, as, as we rolled out e-commerce lending Inc uh, soon became the uh, fortunately and, and very thankfully the, the lender of choice for virtually all the online business brokerage firms in the country. So let's dive in there a bit. You said it's, it's different from your, your traditional kind of lending. Explain to me how that's different. Well, there are a lot of different nuances. I mean, if you go to a traditional brick and mortar business acquisition lender uh, and, and say what's FBA, they would have no idea what's FBA is or what's 3PL or what's dro even drop shipping. A lot of people don't know what that is. And obviously, I mean, that's the, that's the nuts and bolts of online selling. So, um, so that's one nuance. The fact that inventory is being held by Amazon, that's another very large nuance. You know, often, you know, in the traditional business, uh, in the traditional business model, you know, the, the, the seller um, has the inventory at his warehouse or her warehouse. So um, it was definitely a lot of differences between the two uh, fields. Um, I mean, from the outside, it looked very similar, but they're really different kind of like between alligators and crocodiles. They look the same, but they're really not the same. So the same goes with the online business space. Um, so it's, it's, it was kind of a learning curve to learn how Amazon fulfills, uh, fulfills the orders and holds the inventory and, and, uh, and kind of grew that out. And we've been very successful at it um, and really enjoy it first and foremost. And, you know, that's one thing when, uh, when I turned 50 a few years ago was uh, I wanted to do something I really enjoy and it allowed me to really hone in on, on this sector of lending and I enjoy my job each and every day. Awesome. So let, let's talk a little bit about what differentiates you from the other financing options for acquisitions. I mean, with the, the market being so bullish over the last basically 10 years, since the economic crisis that we ran into, the financial crisis. And I would, I would even say remaining bullish considering that the market is as high as it is and there's still acquisitions going on amidst record unemployment and the pandemic. Like I've seen a lot of 
offers for acquisitions out there to help people acquire businesses. So what, what differentiates you from some of the other financing op- options available? Well, I think the first and foremost, in terms of financing options, there really only, you know, there's really only two ways of acquiring an online business. And that's, the, you know, no financing, meaning paying cash. The second is, is obtaining a loan that's guaranteed by the SBA. And there's really no other type of loan available in the marketplace uh, for business acquisition because there's really no tangible asset. There's no there there. There's no, um, you know, other than inventory, there's no brick and mortar. There's not a building that is being used as collateral for the, for the acquisition. So it's really limited to SBA financing. And what is SBA financing? Well, first I'll tell you what it's not. Um, it's not a loan that's, that's funded by the SBA. The SBA is simply the insurance company or the guarantor of that loan. And in exchange for that guarantee, the lender is able to really um, um, be a lot more uh, risk adverse, uh, not risk adverse, but allow a lot more risk in terms of that financing because they have a guarantee by the government in case of default. So it's been, uh, it's been a great program over the years and especially in the business acquisition space, because again, it's simply the only way of acquiring a business uh, through uh, fin- financial means. So what is your target demographic? What are the type of buyers you're looking for? I mean, a couple of things that we look at. Uh, first off, we, what we generally do with our buyers once they're referred to us um, is that we pre-qualify them. So there's kind of two things that we look at in terms of buyers. We pre-qualify the buyer, and then as they get pre-qualified, once we have that solidified, um, we also are able to be able to determine the businesses that they're looking at, if the business that they're looking at is eligible for financing. So let's start with the buyer. Uh, We look at uh, business acumen, and depending on price point, Joe, uh, it's not necessary for... um, in most price points, it's not necessary for the buyer to have direct online business experience, meaning experience running an online business. Oftentimes, if he or she uh, has um, has the strong a strong skill set, transferable skill set, that's good enough. Now, when you do get to the higher price points, you know, two, three, four million, five million dollars, then it, the skill set needs to be a little bit more direct skill set as opposed to indirect. So those are some of the things we look at. Um, another thing we look at is we look at the liquidity of a buyer or buyers. Um, oftentimes, you probably know this, oftentimes when um, someone goes in to acquire a business, it's done oftentimes with groups, meaning two or three people buying a business as opposed to just one individual. Um, so we look at personal liquidity of those people or that person. Uh, So that's the second thing. And we look at other things like credit and some of the more common things, but really um, those are some of the things. And once they're able to identify a business uh, for acquisition, uh, we are very careful to make sure that buyer is the right person to acquire that business. Sometimes, even though the business qualifies and the buyer generally is qualified for business acquisition, the type of business he or she is trying to acquire doesn't match. Or perhaps it's a situation where a buyer is really qualified for a million dollar business, but is looking to acquire a $3 million business. Well, that's not a real match. So those are some of the things we look at, but we're able to um, take a consultative approach with, the, with our buyers to make sure that their profile matches the type of business they're trying to acquire. So in that sense, you're, you're kind of a matchmaker. And uh, so are people coming to you without an intended acquisition or do they always have a business that they're wanting to acquire and then they come to you for financing? That's a very good question, Joe. Almost exclusively, they come to us before they even identify a business to acquire. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's absolutely imperative because um, if they're out looking for businesses to acquire, Um, most competent business brokers um, will not really work with them until they have been pre-qualified with a lender. Um, So oftentimes they come to us beforehand. Um, 
including, I mean, we generate a lot of, um, a lot of clients on our own without referrals. Um, they find us online, they find us through uh, various things that we participate in uh, as a firm. Um, and, but the first thing we do is pre-qualify that client. And, um, and in most cases, or a lot of cases, we do refer that buyer back out to um, some of the competent business brokers that we do work with on a regular basis. So how, how are Amazon sellers leveraging your service? Um, are, are, they, are they using you almost as a vetting service? Let's say they, they have something in mind or where they're looking at potential opportunities to grow their business and then they come to you to make sure that they're qualified and they say, okay, I can grow by acquisition versus I wanna just grow through organic marketing. That's a really good point. Um, Amazon sellers oftentimes come to us um, as they, you know, they're, they're scaling their business, but they really feel like they get to some point where, in, you know, let's, I had one case recently, he, he wanted to buy his comp competitor. And we actually were able to finance um, our client's acquisition of a, his competitor, not only his competitor, but a larger competitor. So he was growing by way of acquisition, which anybody can tell you that's one of the best ways uh, to, uh, to grow that out. As a matter of fact, one of our uh, very good uh, referral partners, uh, Walker Dybul over at um, Quite Light Brokerage, he actually wrote a book called Build, uh, Buy Then Build, which, in, by the way, guys, want a great book to read, read that one. It's really good. But he explains how it's so much uh, you get rid of a lot of heavy lifting by build by buying and then building as opposed to trying to build your own business over time. So have Amazon businesses in any way changed the landscape for e-commerce acquisition or is it, is this, or is it business as usual for you? I would say, I mean, has it changed? Um, I mean, there are a lot more opportunities for a seller um, in terms of selling his or her wares on Amazon. But uh, as a whole, a lot of our clients, uh, I mean, yes, they're, they tend to be Amazon intensive, but they also are able to uh, have other sales funnels to be able to drive business through. So um, from a lending standpoint, um, we're, we're good with 100% Amazon businesses. We do a, a, a boatload of business acquisitions in that space. Um, where we really step in with Amazon sellers is actually when they go to exit their business, to sell their business. And that's one thing that we do with, with a lot of sellers, not just Amazon sellers, is that we are able to take, uh, consult them um, on exit strategies, making sure that their business that they plan on selling, um, you know, qualifies for financing. If anything needs to be done with the financials to make them more appealing upon their exit, um, oftentimes, Joe, they have commingling going on between different businesses. So we're able to, um, to kind of guide them and the, as well as their accountant and oftentimes their business broker to be able to really lay the path for exit. So we do have help Amazon sellers in that respect. It sounds like you're taking a pretty strong advisory role with a lot of your, your clientele or potential clientele. Did you have a lot of business experience prior to e-commerce lending or there, do you have business partners that, that led to being able to give that, those sort of strong advisory services? I mean, I've been in business for, for you know, nearly, nearly three decades, as you can tell by my gray hair. Um, and I've owned businesses, I've sold businesses, I've done a lot of that. So I just use my own experience and also being, you know, we, I don't consider myself just another lender. I mean, I, I've been doing this a long time and, and we really do take an advisory role with our clients. And that's really, I mean, back to your question earlier, what differentiates us, that's one of the main, main differentiators. Um, and that's why people come to us is that we're not just someone lending money. We're actually, you know, we do take an advisory role um, and use our, you know, many decades of experience, um, including my staff, Bill Van Deven, our senior vice president of, of lending, uh, also has uh, 25 years experience in lending as well. So we're, we've, we've seen just about everything. What sort of trends are you seeing? Are there certain types of businesses that are in higher demand right now? Are there, are there, uh, is there, are there certain businesses that there's just too many of them on the market? You know, in terms of what I'm seeing in terms of businesses, I, I think 
the higher demand businesses or anything uh, surrounding pet products, obviously with people you know, under house arrest right now um, throughout many parts of the country, pet products are, are big. Um, and this in general, nutraceuticals or, or anything health related or uh, wellness related, those are generally really good sectors. And, and in terms of being crowded in that, those sectors, there's just a lot of, as those markets grow, there are a lot of opportunities for, um, for buyers to, uh, to obtain businesses within those growing sectors. So we do see quite a bit of that. Well, what type of valuations are you generally seeing for the Amazon businesses that are acquired? Is it all over the place? Or all over the place. Okay. I mean, it really, I mean, it, there are so many different factors, Joe. It could be, um, you know, general price points um, in terms of how the multiples look like. Um, it, it could be a lot of different things that affect what multiples we're seeing. Um, now, obviously, SaaS businesses have a lot higher multiple, but generally, it, it's all over the place. It, it, it even depends on the sector, what, what they're selling. And um, there's just a lot of, a lot of different uh, variables that go into that. Would you call it a buyer's or a seller's market for Amazon businesses? Right now, I'd say a seller's market. Um, the inventory is pretty tight right now, Joe. Uh, and this is what we are hearing as a firm from our, um, our business brokers, our intermediaries out there. And um, we have, we're right now consulting um, a lot of buyers and a lot of buyers are, are, you know, not getting frustrated, but they're, they, you know, I tell them you need patience right now because inventory is a little bit low and they're just absolutely a boatload of, of buyers, especially around the million dollar range of acquisition. As you kind of move up the food chain, less and less buyers, obviously, um, but there's a lot of activity um, one question I get a lot of, how has COVID affected um, online uh, sales? And, and based on, you know, the $50 million that we're currently, of loans that we're currently working on right now, um, I can tell you across the board, online business sales have increased. Um, and that's kind of driven a lot of buyers to hold off on selling their businesses. Um, but, you know, we have plenty of, plenty of sellers selling, but... Definitely inventory is a little bit, a little bit tight right now. So if you're one of those buyers that's trying to be patient, that's frustrated, how do you become more competitive at, at, in that sense of being able to acquire some of those businesses that are in short demand? Is so it just that's a great question. Pay? Fantastic question. Um, and, and actually, I put a blog out there uh, in the blogosphere um, about that. I, th I think three tips, first and foremost, flat out, and very few buyers do this, get pre-qualified, absolutely get pre-qualified. So for example, when they come to us, we pre-qualify them, we provide them with a letter, um, and we're very well known in the marketplace. So generally just saying that they've spoken to us and they're pre-qualified works, but sometimes um, some business brokers require the actual letter to be generated. Um, so that's first and foremost. Secondly, uh, as I pointed out in my blog a couple weeks ago, um, get tight with a business broker, meaning get to know him or her. Um, really, I mean, ask for a 15 or 30 minute consultation and really dive deep on what you're looking for. So when a business that meets that criteria, even prior to it coming to market, um, that business broker, you, you'll be the first they think of to be able to give you, you know, sometimes they give first looks, um, like a preview to a business that will be coming on the market. That's absolutely imperative. Um, so that's, that's number two. And third is making sure before you put a letter of intent in to make sure that you allow us or a lender to pre-qualify the business that you're interested in, because otherwise you're just wasting everybody's time. Uh, if you're going in with a letter of intent on a business that doesn't qualify for financing. So who's looking at that pre-qualification? I'm assuming it's the broker, it's the seller and lender, those three. Is there anyone else? Really, I mean, that, that's pretty much, I mean, definitely the broker and the seller. They're, you know, if you go in, uh, especially if you go in with an offer without us vetting that business, the first thing they're gonna ask you is are you pre-qualified? Or at minimum, have you spoken to a lender? Which really doesn't hold any weight, but 
And usually, yes, we, we were pre-qualified for X amount and we did it through e-commerce lending. Um, generally, I've heard the business brokers really don't ask for the letter, but maybe sometimes they do if they don't know us, but, um, but that's really imperative. Um, and, and back to getting really tight with a business broker, most, we find that most buyers prior to uh, me consulting them, they're simply going on the business broker's website, they're using their search engines, trying to find a business that may fit their, their criteria. That is not the way to find a business because everyone is doing it that way. And you're just a number. You're just one of many people doing it that way. So, uh, you know, it's absolutely vital to get to know uh, a business broker, maybe a few business brokers that are successful, that, that do have the in on, on businesses that will be coming to market. That's how you find a business, not by using search engines. Now let's talk about business brokers. Is there is there a difference between like a business broker on the buyer side versus the seller side, and who you should be working with? Um, help our under, our audience understand that. that. That's a great question. So most buyers um, will will um, get to know a, a a business broker that's representing sellers. So he's more of a listing broker, for lack of a better term. Um, but really, they they do. Um, Unlike maybe when you buy a house, they do um, work both sides, meaning they, they do consult buyers. And when they find a listing that might meet their criteria, then they're able to, to, to play that match. Um, and, but there are business brokers out there that actually only, generally they only represent buyers, meaning in their job as a business broker representing a buyer is to find businesses especially businesses that aren't even in the marketplace that aren't uh, visible uh, and, and play the match from that standpoint. But there are several, I know a few um, actual business brokers that represent buyers. Generally they do charge a fee, um, but it's in most cases well worth it, especially in a hyper competitive environment such as now. Are there any other best practices you would recommend perhaps engaging legal counsel ahead of time or certain CPA firms? Okay. I think the key is um, as you begin your search is to kind of surround yourself with the A team. Hopefully I could be part of your part, part of one's A team, but definitely um, find an attorney that, uh, that knows e-commerce, not just, you know, a family friend who happens to be an attorney. Uh, it's imperative that you find an attorney that knows e-commerce, that knows business acquisition. Um, and we have a few recommendations. So if you need a recommendation, reach out to us. We'll be more than happy to make that. Um, an accountant, uh, definitely an accountant that um, understands uh, that you're going to be acquiring a business. And perhaps he can consult you prior to doing that to make sure that um, the way you, um, you acquire the business is the right tax advantageous way of doing so. So definitely. When would you recommend that someone use an investment banker or someone kind of a little higher up, let's call it, versus going your route? Usually investment bank, I mean, usually, are you talking private equity then? Well, yeah, so let's say someone is interested in buying a company that's 10 million. I mean, we talked about ranges from one to five, right? Or right. they're interested in buying one for 20 million. Um, what would be your recommendation for them? Or, or at what point does it make sense for them to kind of move beyond the type of lending you're talking about? You hit the nail on the head, generally at 10 million. Um, there's kind of, so we lend up to 5 million. Um, and then there's kind of what I call no man's land between five and 10 million, where it's too large for SBA and too small for private equity. We try to help fill that void by having some mezzanine financing available, which brings it up to about seven. But so basically between seven and 10 million, it's really hard. You might have some private equity firm interested, but at the $10 million mark, that's when you're, you're bringing in private equity. Um, that's kind of, you know, in terms of what it look, what the landscape looks like, that's, that's, that sums it up. Awesome. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to talk about some, some S like get into the details here, the nitty gritty, like SBA specifics. So what is the, what is the percent down required for these deals? And does it vary by price? 
And then like what is needed versus recommended? Okay, great question. Um, so first off, in terms of um, what SBA, what the bare minimum SBA requirement is, which sometimes is vastly different than what a lender's requirement is, is 10%. So 10% is the bare minimum requirement. Now, that 10% amount, um, with that 10%, you're leveraging 90% of the acquisition. As long as the business um, is able to cover that debt service, that monthly payment, by way of tax returns, meaning you look at the financials and the financials reflect a number that's high enough that says, yes, the, this business can um, move on a continued basis and cover that debt service, then 10, you know, the 10% is, is the bare minimum. Generally, what I tell people, anything from about a million to, I'm sorry, any, anywhere from our minimum is generally half a million. So anywhere from half a million to a million and a half uh, as long as the business cash flow is adequately enough to cover the debt service, a 10% requirement, um, a 10% down payment is required or injection as it call, it's called. But once you move north of that, um, most of our lending partners are going to require more skin in the game from a buyer standpoint, and uh, which can come from a seller note. That's one thing that, that I, we see a lot of, even though a seller note is not required, Oftentimes, it definitely helps bridge that gap. And also, a lot of our buyers like it because it, um, the seller has skin in the game, you know, to the future success or continued success of that business. So, um, you know, instead of handing the keys to the kingdom to, uh, to a buyer, they have a vested interest on the continued success of that business. So, oftentimes, we don't even have to look at seller notes because they're already included in the offer. But... Um, and as you move up to two, three, four million dollars, five million dollars, generally that injection or down payment requirement from a buyer standpoint starts going up. It could be anywhere from 15, 20, sometimes even 25 percent, depending on the business. Okay, great information there. Let's talk about typical terms. What are you, what are you seeing? Is it across the board, or, or are there standard terms that lenders are offering for? Uh, Pretty standard, but I can tell you kind of the structure of what, what it looks like. So you're acquiring a business. So we're going to finance the acquisition. We're also going to finance inventory you'll be buying from the seller at closing because sometimes it's not part of the acquisition price because it's how much inventory you're buying at closing generally moves, right? Inventory levels change. So we're financing that. We're also financing some working capital, meaning we want to provide our clients as much dry powder as possible for not only the continued success of the business, but continue scaling the business, giving them enough cash to be able to continue this, uh, scaling the business. And then we also are able to wrap in closing costs. So all these points add a total and the down payment requirement starts at 10%. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, it tends to move up. In terms of terms, it's always a 10-year term. SBA rates are at 6% right now, which is our historic lows. So that kind of gives you the, the, the um, overall viewpoint of what a loan looks like. Sometimes um, we provide lines of credit um, as part of the transaction. Some of our clients like that uh, because they're able to draw that line of credit and then pay it down and then draw it back out depending on, you know, buying Christmas inventory or if it's the first of the year where they're, they're, they, their inventory levels drop, so. And you already answered some of my other questions about when to get pre-qualified. Pre it was basically at the beginning of the process. Don't wait, yeah. don't wait until you found a business, okay. And then as far as the maximum amount, we kind of talked about getting north of five million, like there may be some mezzanine stuff in there, seven to okay. 10, you're really in no man's land. So that gives us some good parameters there. But you brought up an interesting point. You talked about how rates are at a historical low. You've been doing this a long time. Help us understand, get a little context here as far as like how things compare now versus in the past. Like how competitive is it now to buy, to buy e-commerce businesses versus 10 or 15 years ago? Well, I mean, e-commerce, well, back then really, um, you know, there was, there weren't any e-commerce businesses. So uh, from that standpoint, but as the, as the space 
grew, meaning the increase of, so overall retail sales, the, the, the online portion of those sales, as it continues to increase, obviously, um, there's more, it's actually getting easier to, um, to provide financing as time goes on, because especially now with this lockdown, people that have never bought anything online or buying things online. So it's kind of opened the eyes of a lot of the public, especially um, older population. So from that standpoint, uh, it's definitely, you know, a good time to buy. And what's kind of odd about right now, Joe, I mean, despite the, the pandemic is that, um, you know, I know we're having a short term blip with this, but the economy still, I mean, it's, it's, it's still moving. Um, and to have historically low rates with an economy with tons of pent up demand is, is a really good time to buy. And right now, if you close by um, September 27th, which oddly enough is a Sunday, the SBA will make your payments, your first six payments on your business to the lender who provided you financing. It's not a forgiveness. It's not a deferment. They literally will send money to the institution that provide you financing to cover your first six months of payment. So right now, if you close by September, you're not looking for, you're not having to make a payment till I think uh, March or April. So a lot of buyers have been kind of sitting on the fence, have really come out of the woodwork. I talked to somebody yesterday who I talked to two years ago about buying a business. Now he's like, I'm going full steam ahead. I need to buy a business. So um, it's an exciting time. Yeah, I, I wasn't aware of that, but that sounds like some incredible uh, stimulus to artificially inflate the demand for people to buy businesses. Right now. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it, it's definitely stimulating. <laughs> what about the the ease to go through the process? How does it compare today versus ten or fifteen years ago? Um process, I mean, it's a little bit laborious. I won't lie. Um, anytime you have the government involved in anything, it's laborious, but we try to streamline the process as much as possible. We have very tight um, uh, systems in place to make it as painless as possible for our buyers. Um, and, you know, we, you know, it's all about organization and we, again, make it as, as easy as possible. The process does take generally 60 days despite what anybody tells you. Um, and it's not as bad as going to the dentist, despite anybody tells you. So again, we, we try to make it as painless as possible, but you have to think about the other side, the fact that a lot of people wouldn't be able to buy an online business without financing. And since this is the only financing available, they're kind of, I mean, you know, you have the choice of one, but the flip side is there's such a low barrier to entry. I mean, just 10% you're in. You, I mean, think about this, Joe. You buy a million dollar company, it's growing at 20%. Generally, these companies are growing at 20% per year, year over year. Your injection or down payment is $100,000. That's a 200% return on your investment. Where are you going to get a 200% return on your investment? Nowhere. So it's, it's a great opportunity. It sounds like a great opportunity. We've seen recently a number of companies, big private equity groups, really interested in what we'd call Amazon roll-up businesses, the type of like the Thrasio type model where they're buy, acquiring a number of Amazon businesses. Um, are, are you seeing any interesting trends out there? Like are the Amazon acquisitions, are those coming from people already selling on Amazon? Are they coming from certain areas in the deals that you're doing? Well, what we see are, is generally current Amazon sellers that are looking to acquire additional businesses and sometimes completely unrelated to what they're selling currently. Uh, that's what we see, but I've spoken to ac uh, private equity firms that are doing roll-ups. Um, obviously, they're buying in bulk in a sense. Um, there's a lot of that activity going on right now in the kind of the mid-market range. What are some things that you would advise people to look out for that may disqualify them from being able to buy a business if they wanted to go down that route? First and foremost, it has to be based in the United States. It doesn't have to sell products in the United States, but it has to be based here and, and submit U.S. tax returns. Um, so that's first and foremost. As a matter of fact, we put, we, that's our, I think our first thing on our website when you go to the Q&A section is make sure the business is in the United States. So um, that question comes up a lot. Um, that's first. 
Um, if it's more of a, it's hard to finance trendy businesses. You know, we're not financing any fidget spinners right now. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> um, we look for a well diversified uh, business where it's selling different products, not just one. Um, we don't like it when one product makes up 90% of its sales. Um, so those are some of the things that we look for. Um, and honestly, the financials of that business are, are the financials that the seller has a disaster. Um, is there a bunch of commingling going on, which is a very prevalent problem with some of these smaller acquisitions. You know, we get the financials and it has, you know, six different businesses reflected on the financials, in the financials. And that's, that's problematic. So really, uh, from, the, from the seller's side, it's about making sure the business is appropriately packaged up for sale. Yes. And it's also making sure that it's perhaps appropriately diversified from the buyer's side. Are there any kind of like lurking variables in there that could somehow derail someone from being able to acquire a business? Oh, um, lawsuits, you know, anything you'd find out, you know, we had a, a situation about a year ago where we were almost, I mean, we were pretty far down the path and the seller didn't disclose that the, that he was in a lawsuit. A, not only a lawsuit, a patent lawsuit, some sort of patent lawsuit. Well, that blew things up. And it seems obvious. You'd think a seller would mention something like that, but no, he, he chose not to. I think he thought he would get away with it. Not sure how, because uh, what us as lenders, the first thing we do during um, this part of the process, not the first thing we do, but during the process, we're running uh, backgrounds on the business, making sure there aren't lawsuits. Um, and he didn't disclose it. It really obviously killed the deal. So things like that, but, you know, encourage buyers to, uh, to hire a due diligence firm to, you know, dig deep in the business. And, and generally they're, you know, it, with part of the LOI is a due diligence period. Generally uh, it's 30 days to be able to do due diligence on the company and ask a lot of questions to the seller. Um, that's always recommended. So there are probably a number of people listening in on this that are thinking perhaps for the first time, wow, I hadn't thought about growing my business by acquisition, but this actually sounds like it's a potential opportunity for me. Have, are you seeing a lot of new entrants to the market as far as buyers right now, or is it just existing clientele that's kind of ramping up and being competitive as far as wanting to buy businesses? Um, a lot of new buyers. Um, I mean, existing clientele, they're always there, but a lot of new buyers and, um, and also a lot of existing clientele that, you know, they, they always thought they'd have to originate a business or found a business to be able to, to, to succeed. And now they had kind of an aha moment going, gosh, if I just buy a small business and scale it, it's, it's a lot easier. And they're starting to, I'm seeing a lot of a lot of our clients do that as opposed to actually, you know, starting their own business. Um, in terms of buyers, um, sometimes I, we have buyers that, uh, you know, some at the lower price levels, you know, they're sick of corporate life. They're sick of working for the man. And they're like, you know what, I'm 40 years old. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to, I'm going to be my own uh, boss. I'm going to, you know, turn in my 40 hour a week job to work 80 hours. So, <laughs> but, so we see a little bit of that and then, and then all, all everything in between. Well, I think this presents a, a compelling opportunity for a lot of brands um, that are already existing and, and also just Amazon sellers in general out there. Um, but also other individuals that may want to put their toe in the water as well. Um, Absolutely. We, we want to thank you for coming on the podcast. It's been an excellent opportunity for us to, to learn about this space. I want to send everyone over to ecommercelending.com to take a look at their site and see what they can do about um, potentially acquiring a business. So thank you, Stephen, for coming on. And we thank look you, Joe, to for having me. And there's a lot of information on that website, a lot of uh, videos and, and blogs and just a lot of information. So feel free to reach out to us as well. Thanks for having me on, Joe. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks for listening to the Buy Box Experts podcast. Be sure to click subscribe, check us out on the web, and we'll see you next time.